the other thing, I mean, we commented about this at the time. I don't think any of us expected the emergent moments of characterization that just plain using the plow powers available to you, yeah. you know, actually generated. Azalea in particular came out with some moments that were like, aren't you supposed to write a thousand word backstory for your character? Aren't you supposed to like dream of these moments and rehearse them and, you know, all this to make them happen in play. And it's like, no, it just busted out from completely unplanned juxtaposition of God Mm. knows what in that moment. Um, I found the game actually to be really rewarding at that level. That's what I was living for. You know, by the time we played a couple of sessions, I was like, that's what I'm playing for. I'm playing for these moments Mm. where these characters just totally, you know, get their, get their big panel. Yeah. Mm. Um, It, it, it might've gotten old after a while, but I certainly, you know, took huge joy in arcane mutterings every time I chance I got my <laughs> James, James was like <laughs> broken James, you can see James up there broken rule broken rule motherfucker I can go berserk and he does more damage than me no <laughs> I invoke my win the game power um, where's my sharpie that, that <laughs> you can't do that anymore it might have gotten old after a while <laughs> it is one of the reasons but it, all, it's also just it did have a lot of fun in its place um one thing i can say is that hardballing you with foes is given the quirkiness of the characters right and mm-hmm. that i'm not dealing with a rogue I mean, I even still call them the thieves. That lets you know something right there. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I'm I'm not dealing with a thief and a cleric and a fighter. Right. And so right. it's a little hard to say, okay, if I throw X at them to kind of get a grasp. I'm discovering what a battle mind is in practical terms, just as, you know, just like you are. Yeah. And so, yeah. um, and I don't really want to presuppose how a combat's going to go. You can play 4E when you do that. You really know what they've got, and you really know what your monster's got, and you just know what exactly, you know, what the chessboard looks like, regardless of who goes mm-hmm. where. And I really wanted to avoid that. I wanted much more of a throw it in, and we'll, I'll play, and you'll play, and we'll see what those powers do against one another. But um, what I'm saying is that I am really often was surprised at which critters kicked your ass and which critters you stomped. It it really was something that I don't know looking back on it that I should value that and say, good, we don't know. We don't right. know which way it's going to bounce, mm-hmm. and that's actually what we want. Uh, we're getting right. away from the idea that I know what you've got, I know what you've got, so I know this is going to take three rounds. Right. You know, right. I want to, I want to not do that. Um, the the kobolds you were up against in almost Ooh. the very first yeah. session. Um, yeah. Th- those bastards. Those were heinous. Yep. <laughs> if we knew, if we knew then what we know now, we would have had. Them. Right, right, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. Strategically. Yeah, perhaps. Yeah, I think that's yeah. the, they, they did we break up your formation pretty bad. I'm sorry, go ahead, Ross. Yeah. I was going to say, if we were going to play in that sort of strategic, that's where we were getting value from. I think you, you need to play more right. than we were able to, to sort of start iterating and getting the skills to work. Well, I think that, the, that, the that learning curve's exactly a good thing. Um, no, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, I'm just saying it. As a pure sort of full on strategic game, you need to commit. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. And in, in the way we played it, I was happy to let that be just something that proceeded at its own pace. <laughs> um, but I kind of looked forward to you guys getting better at it, which you did, which meant that I could throw shit at you that was actually pretty savage. Like that, uh, it was the Guardian thing at the mirror. The yeah. Displacer Beast. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, wait. No, I don't think I ever got to use the Displacer Beast that I skinned that I really wanted to. Um, uh, I, 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 the, um, no, that thing was one of the Guardians. It was one of the homunculi Guardian things. Um, yeah, yeah. Cobra. Something Cobra. Yeah, and I even yeah. used it, kept it as a snake. Um, 
But uh, it was it was really, I mean, you guys got some really good decisions out of it. And I think Ross successfully, like, messed with its movement yes. capacity. Yes. And that mm-hmm. made all the difference. Yeah, but I even think, so, think, it was tearing you up for a bit did. there. Yeah. Yeah. I think there was there were two different things that got applied to it that messed with its movement thing. Right. And so it really ended up getting getting crippled because it right. was only it could only do standard actions and normally Exactly was, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. It lost yeah. its reactivity, I think. And yeah. so um so it worked out really, really well. But uh, there were there were a few times when I was actually kind of pleased, you know, when you guys like would glance at each other and go, All right, I'm losing blood. Are you losing blood? <laughs> <laughs> Let's think about this, you know, yeah. which, is, um, yeah. which I kind of like. Can I ask a question of, of the other players? Um, one of the things that intimidated me a little bit when the game was starting up, this would have been back in December of 17, um, was like actually looking at the hybrid rules and understanding what that meant giving up, right? In terms of, I, I don't want to say niche in a bad way, but right, the notion that like the players in the D and D game typically are members of a war band, right? And the, the guys in the war band have different areas of, of competence and, and specialization. Um, and like it, it, if we had been playing this on, on, a, on a grid, I think it maybe would have been more of a factor than it was because I think we were a little bit fudgy on, on where things actually were in physical space in, in our in our story. Um, but I think that if we had a grid, it would have actually been much more of a problem. Um, because I was thinking that, look, look, I can't do strikery stuff particularly well. I can't do defender stuff particularly well. Uh, like they're, they're, the way that hybrid classes are written, that, that you, you lose uh, class features on, on both ends. So you're kind of having to, to half-ass it on, on both ways. Um, was that something that, that either of you uh, thought about or, or concerned about? Because, like... I felt that I was being pulled in a lot of different directions to the point where I think at the very end when we were like left doing that big step of leveling up, for some reason I'm like, yeah, I'm going to get the ritual caster feat in addition to being like the, the clobbering guy and like the, the mind power guy, I'm also going to be like the nature magic guy because like, like you know, I don't, I'm not wearing enough hats, right? Let me, let me just yeah. let me add on all these. Was this something that, that you guys felt as well? I was very conscious that um by hybriding with the monk as an ardent daily was a lot less um, uh, able to get hit. Took or was much more likely to get hit. So I'm a yeah, player. you were a lot more fragile than either of those is by itself. That's true. So I kind of I kind of went into that by going for a couple of things that then triggered off being blooded and things like that. Yeah. Um, but I think the other thing that made a bit of a difference was the way the um, a lot of the encounters went down was that then we were uh, cutting across fighting things and skill challenges. Yes, yes. Which kind of added, yes. added yet more things for different directions to pull you in, but also kind of opened up different opportunities to direct how those overcome some of the sort of limitations of the slightly uh, not optimized choices you had to make as, as hybrids with limited options for hybridization. Mm-hmm. Gordon, what do you think? Yeah, so the, the, the thing on my end that I remember is just not being sure how much, you know, being being suboptimal was going to hurt, um, not having enough experience with how the numbers all play out to really know, okay, so I'm you know, too lower in armor class than I think I would be if I were a monk. Is that really going to make the difference or not? And and most of the time, what I found most interesting was that having to make those trade-offs made for a, a an interesting character and, and gave me, you know, both something that I can do in sort of the hand-to-hand punchy monk way and in the scion blast mine, you know, kind of thing. And so it, w- it was nice that I did... I. I experienced pleasure in not having to specialize um, because I kind of surrendered. Well, you know, it may not be possible to actually optimize to be the actual best right. I could possibly right. be at this. So maybe it's okay. And, you know, ultimately, uh, yeah, it'll, we'll find out 
from this game system if that's a a viable strategy or if we just get smushed flat and i don't right. know if the adding in the that's skill cool. challenge is another way of dealing it was one of way of ron's compensating for for losing some of that optimization or if there were other things he did to compensate for it but that that was my i i remember that okay i can't optimize so just don't right. worry about it <laughs> right but let me let me yeah, go ahead, actually James. rephrase what i because i don't mean optimizing in the sense of in some absolute sense the best person in the northern hemisphere at, at playing this particular character sure but, sure but the the thing about the battle line class design is that it has two features and I can't remember exactly what they do, but, but one of them is like it allows you to follow your enemy as he moves around the battlefield. And there's something else that, that allows you to like do ongoing damage when you're following him around. Right. right. So following him around does nothing if you can't do the damage. On the other hand, doing the damage when you can't follow him around um, and he's not in range right. also doesn't do anything. Right. And when you're a hybrid you have to pick one or the other. I actually thought that was one of the. I actually thought that was a flaw in the hybrid rules. Was particularly for the for the psionic characters was splitting the two aspects because in the in the psionic classes the two features you got were actually quite well chosen, and the battle yeah. mind in particular, I kind of you know was sad that they they split that. Um, and and so, uh -huh. but what I felt was. That like, man, how do I even do my job? It's not a question of optimization. It's yeah, like, yeah. Am, I, am I competent to do this at all? And one of the things that I that I, I don't normally uh, look on RPG Net for this kind of thing, but like I did look, you know, what they had to say about battle mine, and a number of them said, look, even a single class battle mine is pretty weak at this defender thing until he hits level seven, and then there's right. some sort of like power that they get there that, that suddenly they can actually keep pace and maybe even be a little bit better than most other defenders. But, like, I remember thinking, like, man, do I even have the right tools for, for this particular thing? It's not a question of, like, being great at it, but, like, can I even, can I even do this, right? And so right. it was... Yeah, like, yeah well, and I guess that, that, that will be very class-dependent. Like, you know, I, I figured, okay, I can punch somebody, and I can zap them with my mind, so I can be a monk and a scion. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I don't need a lot more than that in order to The monk actually is level. the one that was hurt worst by the hybridizing, because the the monk's flurry um, in a uh, in most of the hybrid classes, you basically just combine the two weapon sets. And okay. if you have powers that apply to weapons, then they apply to all your weapons, even the ones you get from the other mm -hmm. class. But the monk right, can't. Right. The monk can only apply to a monk weapon. So you can like have a long sword for your argent. But you can't use a monk power. You can't flurry with it. And right. or in use any of the other monk powers with it. And that's really painful. It's a big drop in effectiveness. And that's why I really recommended sticking with the staff and the spear, because that would, you know, that would that would that would apply. You could, you know, use it. Yeah. That, um, that but the um but in the case, uh, well, the thing I was going to say, it taps into a little bit of what Gordon was saying. Since you didn't have a choice of monk versus monk hybrid or argent versus argent hybrid the strength of the build on its own of the class on its own wasn't part of the game so fortunately right. that wasn't right. a genuine loss in terms of comparison with somebody else playing something else so i yeah. learned, i learned yeah. that in the first round when i did this and i rebuilt my structure for the game uh on the, from that insight and if you'll note if you, if you look at the 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 structure we used. It was a controller or a defender or a leader. Mm -hmm. um, and then everybody had to hybridize. And the only two things you could choose to hybridize with one or the other were strikers. Right. Yeah. So therefore yeah. it was very, very structured. Everybody was half a striker. Yeah. And um, I did that as carefully as I could. And in right. using the tools that, you know, clearly being in the player's handbook three, clearly the hybrid rules, especially because they were working with all those different classes, we yeah. know they weren't play tested thoroughly. We know. Right. And so, um, you know, I can see how we're going to find a couple of gaps or a couple of tricky parts here and there. There's even a paragraph yeah. in the book saying, look, once you start hybridizing, a yeah. whole bunch of careful balance stuff that we built 
goes out the window, so beware. And um, yeah. my take, though, was that if certain advantages of the full build for a given class were gone or lessened greatly, I was hoping that we would find emergent properties of the combination to yeah. strengthen instead. And I think right. we were actually finding a few here and there that were yeah. a little surprising, <laughs> um, which is kind of what I hoped for. And uh, oh, you'll also notice that since I was going with raw aesthetics for race and character class, and I love the fact that it worked out this way. Just loved it. There was not a single race whose pluses were optimized for their class. And that, if you go into the 4E swamps of the internet, you will oh, find yeah. that it is the first god to bow before. Thou shalt pick yeah. the race and the class whose automatic pluses are on the same attributes. Thou shalt. Right. And that's it. You got to do that first step. And I loved the fact that I took that god and smashed its idol instantly. Right. And um, it's difficult to see why it's so important when you can pick the rest of your stats. It's not. You want. That's it's the like, point. It's just another plus two, and you get tons of other plus twos from powers and feats and everything. It's actually not structurally that big a deal, but it it it's a. Uh, it's immediately accessible. Pick the right race, pick the right class, get your plus four, get your plus four, and you're done. Yeah. You know, and it feels and see, good, right? Or, wait, you don't yeah. get pluses from the from the class, but what you do is you have the, the attributes that are maximized for it. Or do you? Right. Whatever. Right. But the point is, is you pick them, and, and you bump up, and you really feel like you have chosen, you have, you have done the optimal thing. And you feel good about it. And I think it's the charge of feeling good about it that people are not going to let go, even if it doesn't matter. Yeah. Well, yeah, even and I think that that's, yeah. I think to an extent, that's that's a carryover from the 3035, yeah. um, where, you know, as opposed to um, not stressing out about all your little pluses and pluses from here and there, you do really need to stress ab out about it. And, you know, they, they in fact, uh, flat out stated that. We're designing this with system mastery in mind right. so that people can get that little charge of I'm the right. clever player who knows that, you know, you don't take this feat, you take that one. Right. In the very, very earliest versions of the game, um, getting any kind of plus at all was was difficult in, in zero e and then in first edition and in basic uh they sort of standardized it a little bit but yeah first but, edition they had your armor your weapons versus armor table which everybody forgot to use in yeah. play um, yeah um but like in basic if you had a, an 18 strength for example you had a plus three to hit at level one right and when else at best just on their class had a plus one so you don't as a fighter you don't get a plus three to hit until like fifth level or right something. So, no, so mm -hmm. having that that stat bonus really does make a difference. I mean, it, it's I think it's bad form to actually care about your stats that much in basic, but nonetheless, I do understand why people do care about it. In fourth edition, all that stuff like wash comes out in the wash. I mean, you can get it with a feat if you can't get it through your race. Right. The one thing about the race, so that does matter, is that encounter. Right. That as a minotaur, I had a charger, like a ability to charge something. The going charge. If yeah. I a, if I had been a wizard. The hell, what am I going to do with that, right? Like, the, that's 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 dead weight. Um, there's a couple of classes that are races that have, like, the ability to teleport, right, right? Which would be very useful for a wizard, but not very useful for, for somebody who needs to, like, plant themselves somewhere right. and stay there. Um, and so I can get why, why that mixture with a class does make a difference. But I never saw the analysis talk about that, right? It, like, no right. one would ever say, like, you've got to be a gnome because the gnome is really good at, I don't know, being an, an Avenger or something like that for the following reason. It was always just like, you get a plus two to this, and a plus two to that, and that's what you need. Right. You're not impressed? Yeah, yeah. Well, I was kind of glad not to, like, even make that particular temptation available. And that you just yeah. had to kind of say, you know what? Um, and, and everybody was in the same boat. One thing I, I reviewed <laughs> when I was setting this up was that there was no monster choice that obviously outweighed the others. Um, and I And I remember thinking... If somebody goes into this and then starts using kind of the, the optimizing approach, they're going to keep hitting a brick wall whichever way they turn. I did. Yeah, yeah. And I, but, <laughs> but, but everybody was, and I was okay with that. But now that's where right. you are. Play that. Yeah. And everybody's in that boat. We're all going to be in that boat. 
and we're going to make that our own brand of optimal right. in some way, right. um, which was right. what I was hoping for. 